Okay, here we go. Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living. Today I have a guest, a very special guest. We're going to be talking about the human design system. Emma Juilliard. The human design system is based on the Kabbalists, astrology, I Ching, and so much more. And she's a master at the human design system. And I'm very pleased to have her in the studio today to share with me about this and so much more. Emma, thank you for joining me in the studio today, and how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me, Victoria. Happy to be here. Welcome. Thank you. So, how long have you been doing the human design system? And let's start from the very beginning. Who is the founder of it, and what is this human design system all about? Well, um, I think that the person that designed it was Ryu, and it happened over 25 years ago. It might be a little bit longer than that now. He died a couple years ago. Um, I got involved in it when I was at a party and someone said, have you seen your human design body graph? And I said, no, you know, what's that? And so she brought it out and showed it to me, and quickly after that I was studying with Ra, and online, all of the classes are done online. I've been studying it about four or five years. People often study for seven years or more because it's such an in-depth study. It incorporates so many of the studies. The I Ching is a study in itself, the Book of Changes. Astrology, which has been used throughout millennium to observe our universe and connect with it and try to understand it. The Kabbalah, all the mysticism that has been involved in religion. And uh, the chakra system, which involves the energy bodies. And um, although it's not a religious system, it certainly doesn't exclude people that are religious. It's, it incorporates the ancient tools that we've been given to understand ourselves. And the idea behind the human design system is to isolate the type of personality you are, how you're going to be interacting with others. It's all about relationship and how you interact with your environment and with another. Definitely. And with yourself. And absolutely with yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the anarch types, let's go over those. Most systems, you know, in the uh, Myers-Briggs, most systems will come up with types. And so at the moment we have two types in the room. Yourself, which is a manifesting generator, and myself, with it, which is a projector. And in human design we have four types. And generators are the type that is, the population runs on generating energy. It's just like, just like the machine, a generator. It just goes, 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 right? It has a battery that has energy all the time and can go all the time. So in the generator type, there are two types, a generator and a manifesting generator like yourself. So there's the generator that has a very open aura, very relaxed. They have this energy that is with them all the time. And a manifesting generator usually has more motors. They can go all the time. <laughs> a lot of your top athletes will be manifesting generators because they have that kind of drive and power. How about the actors and actresses? Actors and actresses, um, well, across all types, of course, you'll, you're going to find actors and actresses. But um, on my type, like projectors, projectors, um, are here to learn about the other. And when they learn about the other, they learn about themselves. So projectors like to study systems. So when I saw this system that incorporates huge systems, of course, that, that was a big draw for me to study it. So when you say a generator and manifester, such as I, has going all the time, such as an athlete, are you saying that they have a lot of energy only? It's, it's an abundant amount of energy because they are the duality of the two? The duality, I wouldn't say that they're, they're the duality of the two, but they do have, in human design, there are motors. Different centers are motors. And normally, a manifesting generator will have more motors. And by that very fact, they have more energy. 
like you, for instance, you mm -hmm. have the root motor defined, you have the sacral motor defined, which makes you a generator, and you have the emotional center defined. You have other centers defined too, but those are motors. Those are the motors that are defined. So you have three motors. So let's break down these areas. Uh -huh. When you say the root. The root. And? On the body graft, if they want to show that little uh, body graft at the moment, on the body graft it shows the centers, which are the mm -hmm. chakra centers. And the one at the very bottom is the root. Mm -hmm. And for you that's defined. So it, it can, it, so your energy doesn't feel like it's um, racing to keep, keep up with itself. It's content to be where it is and take care of what needs to be done. On the very top on your chart, um, you have a completely open crown. It's not surprising that you do this kind of work and, and are so open to mm -hmm. hearing all these ideas and different viewpoints that people have come up with because your mind is completely open. When you say open? Open, the, the center on the graft is completely clear. There are no gates hooking up to it. It's completely open. So you're open to all kinds of things. Sometimes, perhaps in your life, you've, you've taken someone else's thought and run with it without even realizing. Because, like you can be in the line in a supermarket. Say you're in the line in the supermarket next to, next to me and you don't know me. And I'm sitting there thinking of, I want a chocolate sundae with bananas and strawberries and whipped cream on the top. And you, you're allergic to ice cream. You don't even eat it. You walk out the store thinking, I want an ice cream with strawberries and chocolate because I was standing next to you and my thought went into your lovely open mind and, and you thought it was your thought. So isn't that an empathetic person with mm -hmm. empathy mm -hmm. that is feeling in the greatest amount of degree of other people's emotions, feelings and thoughts? Well this is more about the thoughts that come in. The feelings are in different, in this particular center, this is about the thoughts. The things so it's that, thoroughly their thoughts and not their emotional level of You their would be attuned to that personally because you are an emotionally defined person. Yes. So yes, you would. But it, it isn't necessarily from the crown mm -hmm. center that that happens. So is that the manifester or the generator that is feeling that of the emotions of others? Well, um, or a combination of both? If you have a, an emotional center that is not defined, you're going to feel other people's emotions kind of as chaos. If you have a defone, defined emotional body, um, you're going to feel your own emotional wave, whatever that is for you. It's a chemistry that runs on the nervous system. And it can be triggered by anything. It can be triggered by a breeze. Um, you know, it can be triggered by emotions or shortcomings or whatever's going on with you at the time, but it can be triggered. And that emotionality then takes you on the chemistry of this ride and what's important about the chemistry is to not make a story out of it. Because as soon as you make the story out of it and get someone to agree with it, you've gotten this story in agreement about something that was just chemistry. So for an emotional per person that has lived in a world of taking that chemistry and making a story out of it and sharing it with someone and making it real, they, uh, it keeps everything out away from them instead of just understanding their own emotional wave. But, <laughs> so let's define the basics again for those who do not know about the human design system. Mm -hmm. They are? The basics as far as the systems that it incorporates? Yes. Well, it, the different, there's a generator, there's a the manifester, types. the uh -huh. type. So we have mm -hmm. the generator, which there are two, the regular generator and the manifesting generator. Then we have the projector and we have the manifester and the reflector. And in, and in the statistics that human design has gathered, generators, the whole pool of them, uh, are about 73% of the population. So m most of the people that you're around are generators. And they're the worker bees because they have all these motors because they can do and accomplish. And they're designed to simply respond to that motor if that motor goes if they hear something within themselves or hear a sound within themselves, then they know that it's time for them to move in and use that energy. Where um, a projector, for instance, the way they move their energy is simply by being invited. Once they're invited, the energy moves. It, it moves on invitation. It isn't on a motor because most projectors don't have a motor. I happen to have one because I'm emotionally defined. But 
uh, a lot of projectors wouldn't necessarily have a motor to drive that energy. So their energy moves on the invitation, and the invitation is usually about offering someone guidance about themselves. So this is actually done by their birth, the exact time their birth, the same way that you would find the astrological. It is. It is. The, you need the birth time and place, mm -hmm. and then you can pull up the body graph that gives you the type. It gives you uh, their inner authority. Usually what we start with in human design is teaching someone their type. So, for instance, a manifesting generator. There are things that go with being a manifesting generator. There are things that are part of that type. And when you know that part of that type, you can be truer to yourself. Then we look at... Um, oh, such as what part of type would be for a manifesting generator? Then we would look... Well, the things that a manifesting generator wants to be uh, alert to is one, is moving to their sacral energy, is moving when, for instance, when something actually gets you up out of the chair, then it was correct for you to move. That's what's correct for a manifesting generator. When people ask them questions and they say, like for instance, if you were to say to me, you want to go see a movie tonight? I say, do you want to go see a movie tonight? Now I've asked you the question and you can respond to me, hopefully, not with your mind, but with a sound. Uh-huh, I do. As soon as you say, uh-huh, that's your sacral speaking. That's your guttural sounds that are telling you that yes, indeed, you want to do that. Now we've actually gotten in the car and we're on the way to go to the car, go to the movie. Yes, there's something that is reoccurring constantly throughout the decades of my life and that would be that I have a feeling that I've never heard and until I understand that the the person has heard me and they've clarified that, they've let me know that, I have this constant, constant feeling that I need to know if they've heard me. Uh -huh. so, so where would this be coming from? Well, I'd have to actually see your chart right in front of me to... But generally speaking of a, of a manifestor generator, I'm using this you as an example. You want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so when, when people, when you're in conversation with people, how do you know that you're being heard? I don't. They don't let me know, mm -hmm. mostly. But then I ask them and I try to clarify more right. and often it still eludes me because they don't really answer. Uh -huh. Or if they're answering, they're very ambiguous, so very uh, loose. Okay, very, answer. Yes. The thing, f most of the time you're with generators, so most of the time you want to ask questions that have to be answered with a sound rather than an intellectual answer. If you're asking a generator a question that keeps them in their intellectual brain, they're never going to get down here and answer, mm -hmm. answer with that guttural response, which is a sound. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. All of those sounds, that's, what you, that's the answer you want yes. Yes. when you're talking to someone. So it's more, and, and it takes time to think about, how can I phrase that question so that I'll get a response from them instead of an intellectual answer. Well, I thought I wanted to go, but then I didn't want to go, and then I, thought, I was thinking maybe I would want to go, instead of just getting to that response, uh-uh, I don't want to do it. So, it's about keeping it very basic and yes. very simple. It is. And the more simpler, the better. Yes. Absolutely. In other words, one question should only be one question. It shouldn't be layered like three, because you're, again, you're waiting for that response, for them to give that response. And it's an art to ask mm -hmm. the right questions. And then you'll know you're heard. Because when you get that sacral response, you'll know. And I know you know what it feels like. The difference between you and a generator, a straight generator, is once a generator responds and gets up to do something, they can't change their mind. You, on the way to the car, going to the movie, can say to me, uh-uh, I don't want to go to the movie. I changed my mind. And we turn around and we go back. Hmm. You have a way out. A straight generator doesn't. Once they've, once they've aligned their energy, once that sacral res has responded, they have to finish it. So I'm operating on many tracks, and a generator is on one track only. <laughs> well, it would depend on how they were defined. There's a lot of definition, and I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't want to say. Generally speaking. But as a way to get a response, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes generally speaking, as a way to get a response. And anytime someone asks you a question, 
instead of going into your beautiful open mind, because you may be answering it with their information, go all the way down here and see if you can answer it with a sound. And that's your truth. And that's keeping it simple again. That's keeping it simple. Okay. And making sure that when you're using your motors that they were all in agreement. Because what happened is when well, you got in the car and changed your mind, something in you wasn't in agreement. You, you just didn't want to. It's really hard for parents that have little MG children that, you know, got them in the car to go to the roller skate rink and they were all excited to go and then all of a sudden they're having a meltdown and they changed their mind and didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. And MG being? A manifesting generator. Okay. Pardon me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a good parent, you'd want to turn around and, and take the child home. And is not there force any to clues to uh, being able to tell what a person is when you first meet them? Yes. Um, a generator, again, their aura is really relaxed and open. Their, their aura is open, so they're open to everything. And a lot of them will kind of like, they'll, they'll like lounge, you know? They have a very relaxed part of them because they have the motors, they have everything they need. Um, rock and they're self-contained. They're self-contained, yes. you know, and they're comfortable and um, and they're relaxed. And and uh, each one is going to be defined a little bit differently. So, but as far as a type, that would be the type. Mm -hmm. Now, a manifesting generator often will have the channel of charisma. So often, when a manifesting generator walks into the room, everybody wants to meet that person. Like, who's that? I want to know. You know, because they have this thing that they bring in with them. You know, and their aura isn't quite so open because there's this manifesting tendency. So you kind of have to be invited in, you know, a little bit. Yeah. And a projector? A projector, um, a projector's aura goes right into another person's aura. So some people don't like that. You know, and the other thing about a projector is they're one on one. If there were three people here, I can't penetrate three people's auras at once. It's only one. So as soon as I'm talking to you and focusing on you, those people feel left out because they are. So projectors work best one-on-one. -on -one. They're all about the other and, and guiding the other into whatever is going on at that time. Most gen, uh, projectors are very open. Marilyn Monroe, Michael Jackson. When, when project, because projectors usually don't have their own motors, they magnify the, the energy that comes towards them. So you can see how both Marilyn Monroe and Michael Jackson used the energy of a room to become bigger than. And that's what a projector can do because they have a lot of empty centers in them, normally. I've seen some that don't, but usually. They will magnify the energy in the room. And in astrology, is it the same in the human design system where if you're born at the beginning of the month, middle of the month, the end of the month, in astrology, it does make a difference? There are so many things that make a difference in the human design system because there's so many layers. First we look at the type, then we look at the inner authority because the inner authority, when you understand your type and your inner authority, hopefully you can start making choices and decisions that are aligned for you individually. And then, then there's all kinds of layers. There's your life work, your destiny, what challenges your life work, your hidden gifts, um, where your Mars is in the design sign shows where things can get, um, can come at you in the wrong direction. You and I both have the gate to provoke. So for myself, when I was young, if I would be emotionally distraught or emotionally in my soup, I would provoke in usually the completely wrong way. I would provoke and end up with more damage than good. What you can do with that energy is provoke people to a higher place and to a higher wisdom. So provoking can be a good thing. So when you yeah. say you were provoking when you were younger as a child, you were acting out at that time? Would it be I think most to that? of the time when I would provoke, and, and when you have that gate, you can provoke just by walking in the room, you know. But if I was emotional, if I was really upset emotionally, I would usually provoke in a way that didn't get me what I wanted, you know, because I was mm -hmm. emotionally and distraught. And how are you provoking? Um, what's a good example of me provoking? I can think of all kinds of comical things I've done in classes where I, where I provoke the room. Um, anything that gets the reaction that you don't want is a provoke, you know? Such as? Yeah. Such as? 
Um, well, for instance, you and I both have it. If we walked into a room and provoked somebody that we were there to meet that we wanted to actually have a, a good relationship with, and for some reason we provoked them as soon as we walked in the room in a negative way, we didn't even have to say a word. It's, the connection is not going to work. It's because of the way that gate hooks up to the other side of the gate, and you can't determine that. That's, that's in someone else's aura. So the way you provoke them is the way you provoke them. You won't necessarily have control over it. Wouldn't necessarily be something that you even did deliberately. But can you neutralize that of what is happening on the unseen that you're saying? I think you by can. By being in a neutral state with yourself like being, and your energy. Yes. For me, for instance, when I'm in my emotional soup, when I'm really emotional, mm -hmm. I make a point not to kind of go out and be social or be with other people because... I'm not right. I'm kebabbled in my own self. And, will, and it can often, just by going out with that kind of energy, provoke things I never expected to encounter. And it's because the energy is bouncing off of. Well, give me an example of that. Like, um, let's say you're in your emotional stew and you did go out, and what kind of Things would be happening, and what kind of reactions, and um, unfavorable events? Well, I can would just remember place. one one instance that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. There was a neighbor that was upset about something, and I went over to talk to that neighbor about something, and they absolutely blew up at me. I mean, just forcibly. I mean, it didn't have anything to do with the situation, so it's an energetic thing. You can see at the moment, it's like, well, where did that come from? Why is it so big? I didn't even say hello yet. It's just the energy. It's the energy, for one, if I'm not clear, and if I'm emotional in the wrong way, if I'm emotionally upset, nothing I say is going to be quite right. It's going to be off, and it's going to get things that are going to be off coming back at me. Definitely. Right. Hmm. It sounds to be a very exacting science to it, but a lot of people are going to be looking at it such as they do with astrology, and they really don't understand astrology that's been used for thousands of years. Thousands of years. And the nobles and the kings and many people have yeah. taken it very serious. Right. Uh, is it like astrology? Does it have to do with the stars and the positions? And It does. It and does. the planets? And then it has another layer, because that's done, just as it is in astrology. But then 83 or 84 days before that, there's another whole graph that is done. Because in human design, that's when we feel that the soul actually entered into the body in the womb. And, and that gives you another whole uh, column, just like on, on the astrology side, of information. Layers and layers and layers of information. On that side of the chart, it's the information that works through you. You're not maybe conscious of it. People will see it in you. They'll say, oh, you know, you always do that or something. You'll go, I do? Because it's, it's there in you. It's the unconscious part of you that people see. Hmm. That can sometimes trip us up too. So are you teaching classes in the human design or do you do consult on one-on-one? -on -one? I do mostly consulting one-on-one. -on -one. I have done classes. The little Mickey Mouse charts I was showing you were from the classes, you know. Yes. Um, but mostly, the most of it is one-on-one -on -one because I'm a projector, and um, I like working one-on-one. -on -one. And the in information is so personal. In a group, all you can do is talk about type and authority. You can't really go into all the the individual things that that speak to that individual person. So give me an overview. You were working with somebody that you've met for the very first time. And you're going to be having this uh, schematics of blueprint about who they are, their personality, how they're receiving information, how they process information. You're going to find out the, the pro and the con of both of that. So you're going to be able to advise them how to act accordingly to different situations? Well, the first thing I would do is advise them on their type and, and, and how that type, how that energy body moves through the field. That's what the type is all about, is how your energy moves through. And then I would talk to them about their authority because their authority, when they know their authority, for instance, emotional authority. We both have emotional authority. For us, 
almost always we should at least wait for 24 hours before we make a decision. So when anybody wants a decision from you in the moment, on the spot, you say, I don't make decisions on the spot. Yes, that's very true. Mm -hmm. I've always known this and thought it to be uh, honoring my intuitiveness. Exactly. Right. And I have to let the intuitive energy to speak to me. And if it's not speaking to me, I can't really analyze things from the logical, mental part of the brain. It, it's kind of like forced and it's awkward. So it's got to speak from my gut. And exactly. from my gut, I honor that. And yes. if it's not speaking, I wait to listen to the whispers, as they say. Uh -huh. Right. Absolutely. Well, your chart. Specifically, you have a lot defined on the bottom. So you're emotionally defined, but you're also splenically defined. So splenic people, when, when someone is just splenically defined, they can make decisions like that in the moment. They make decisions so fast that for you and I, it feels a bit like a carnival ride. It's like, how did you do that? <laughs> now you're doing what? You know, they're usually in relationship fast, out relationship fast. They do everything in the moment, you know. For us, on the other hand, they're, what they say about our authority is that there is no truth in the now. Because in the now, we're always having some emotionality come in and color it, and perspect it, and view it. And we have to wait for that coloring to kind of shift and change so that we can see the truth. And sometimes, depending on how emotional we are, we might have to wait for that to happen a few times. Wait for calm waters a few times and then go, okay, now I know that I can move forward on this. Now I'm ready. But there is no rush with an emotional. Everything is slow. There's no straight line <laughs> because all the emotions get in there and you've got to, oh, I'm having an emotional day, so maybe I'm going to, you know, be under the covers all day. You and know? the worst thing that one could do who is that, that needs to listen to their intuitiveness and not act from the mental, and the worst thing they could do is to work from that energy of others that others are prodding them along yes. and saying, I need this now, I, I need this yesterday, and, and we're going to do this quickly. And they acquiesce to that, right? and all of a sudden they feel they're overwhelmed, Right. the feeling is. And in that situation, you could provoke someone, right? Because you're not able to, you're a little bit better designed than that, but a lot of emotionals aren't able to do that in the moment. So they could, of course, provoke, well, come on, we're, we're doing this now. Well, you guys go ahead. I'll meet up with you. It just gives you that little lag again so that you can actually catch mm -hmm. up with them. Because <laughs> now people don't live in the place that emotional people live. We're, we're lagging behind. We need more time. We need more time. That's all. What sort of success stories have you seen with people who ha you consulted with? I and can they, think of their life just totally <coughs> turned around. One dear friend of mine, in fact, she was my study buddy in human design, which I was very gifted to have her as a study buddy. And um, she is a projector, like myself. That's why the instructor tuned us into each other, because it's really fun for a projector to have another projector friend. And she's a mental, which means all of her energy is mentally processed. She's a mental projector. She's a classic mental projector. And for her, next to an emotional being, she can just kind of go from one thing to the next thing because she has all this clarity and all this, you know, mental uh, clarity. And um, her dilemma is that she has a daughter that's an emotional. So here she is being very clear, trying to be very clear with her emotional daughter, but her emotional daughter, at least half the time, is in her emotional soup. So she can't hear her mom's clarity. She can only hear her mom's clarity when she's not in her emotional soup. When she's in her emotional soup, she just wants a hand on her shoulder to be held, to be touched. Emotional people, what soothes our nervous system, because it's a chemistry that goes through the nervous system, what soothes that is to be touched. So if in a, for an emotional, when an emotional comes home and you say, how was your day? You'd want to you'd touch their shoulder when you said it, because then they would drop into themselves and they go, well, it was, you know whatever it was. If it's a mental person, they're, they're not so inclined to come up and brush up against you or wrap their arms around you. They're going to tell you very straightforward what was going on with them, you know, very clearly. So for her, even though she had had lots of therapy with her daughter, this piece that her daughter was emotional and she wasn't 
was the missing piece that changed the relationship and was very profound in the relationship. Another one I had was with, um, that was really profound was a family, a divorced family where the parents had never gotten together with the children. And once I counseled on the mother of the family, on the dynamics for the father and the children, they were all able to come together and start doing functions together. So it was just a whole huge healing for the family because this lets you see people in a way that you can separate a little bit and have more compassion and understanding. Oh, they're not this way, then I won't do that with them because that will just upset them, you know, or, or they're mental, so I'll be a little bit clearer when I talk to them. I imagine it would be a much better world if we all were able to do so mm. and connect to each other and to know exactly how that person is really operating and know how they're not operating and then we could adjust our frequency to be able to help them to yes. communicate. Also. Like for instance, you and I, if we are in emotional soup, really kebabbled, mm -hmm. it, when we take that energy, that chemistry, to a person that is not emotionally defined, maybe they're splenic, maybe they're in the now, our emotional soup is registered in their aura as chaos and all they want to do is push it away. So it's not the place to go and be nurtured because we've just kind of disrupted their, their sense. And so, in other words, you don't want to go to a non-emotional and amp your emotionality. It won't get you anywhere. And sometimes when you're real emotional, you know how you want to just keep amping it and amping it? Some people do. <laughs> it doesn't do any good to do that with a non-emotional because it, it will disrupt them a lot. How about for the business world, the corporate world? How can the human design be benefited? Well, the there? corporate world is, is kind of cool, and there, mm -hmm. is, there is a whole system for the corporate world called uh, B2B, I think, or anyway. It's, it, it's about understanding, because once you get into the dynamics of what happens with auras when they come together in types, when you have more than five together, there's a certain dynamic that happens with five. We call that a penta. And then when you get into dynamics of maybe five groups of five, which is 15, that's a wa, And that has a completely different dynamic. So depending on the size of your, the company and how big it is, depends on how these dynamics can help. And if you have a manifester, a manifester is designed to inform the group of what they need to know. So a manifester usually is the person kind of at the top or rung informing people of what they need to know. Not a manifestor generator? Not a manifesting generator, just a manifestor. Manifestors are only 8% of the population. They have um, a closed aura. You kind of have to be invited in. You mm -hmm. have to wait for a manifestor to approach you. If you approach a manifestor mm -hmm. first, you'll kind of hit a wall. Who do you think is a well-known figure? Who is a well-known manifestor? Um, Bill Gates or Donald Trump or? Ra was a manifester, the fellow that developed this system. I'm, I'm, of course, going through all my personal friends that are manifestors, but that's not answering your question as to far who out in the world is a manifester. It'll pop into my right. mind in a you minute. You mentioned Marilyn Monroe and Michael Jackson. They were projectors. Yes. But and, um, and Sandra Bullock's a reflector, which is another type that we'll talk about in a minute. Bring a manifestor. I can't think of one at the moment. So there is another. A man, a and reflector. then there's a reflector, and there's only we did one not speak percent. About them. We didn't talk about okay. them. Only one percent of the population is a reflector. A reflector, when you look at that body graph, none of those centers are light lit up. So they are completely open. So they're open to everything that comes into their environment. They're open to all, everything in their environment, every aura, and everything defines them. So their canvas is always changing. So they're in the rhythm of life. They're, the way they make a decision is to wait the whole cycle of a moon. It takes them a whole month to come to decision because, because they're constantly being defined by their environment and by, by the astrology you know, that's moving through their chart because that's going to light up different things as it moves through every month. So they're in a Constant, perpetual yes, process. Yes, rhythm of the moon. They're in the constant uh. rhythm of the moon. And if they honor that, their life will calm down. 
And Otherwise, if they don't honor it? If they don't honor it, they're being defined by everything around them all the time. Everything around them all the time is changing. It's kind of like sand under the feet. How, where do you stand? You know, you've got to make a, a slower process to be able to see what they're here to reflect to you because they're open. So they're going to reflect yourself to you. They're like, a, when you look at a reflector, you're looking at a mirror. Almost, you know. Mm. Sandra Bullock's, I think, a great example of a reflector. So let's go back to the very beginning. You mentioned I Ching, I Ching and astrology and Kabbalists. Kabbalah. And Kabbalah and the chakras. How does it incorporate the human design system? Each from How does it borrow from each of those? So all of those systems are incorporated into the software, so to speak. So when you look at that mandala that I showed you earlier, around the outside of the ring are all the gates of the I Ching. Then when you come in more to the ring are all of the, all of the information on the astrology. Now when you come into the body graft itself and you see those little diamonds and squares, those are the chakras. And when you look at the channels between the chakras, that's the Kabbalah. That's the force of life. And the way those channels and gates hook up with other people move your life. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, books of, the Book of Change in those gates, um, you know, without seeing the body graph in front of you, it, it makes it a little bit harder to explain, but when we have just one gate instead of the whole channel, that gate wants to hook up. It's kind of like out there in the wind, flip, you know, waiting to hook up. Now it hook ups. It can hook up six different ways on the other side. So when it hooks up, it doesn't know if it's going to feel quite right. So sometimes when it hooks up, it can feel right at the beginning, and then it won't feel right afterwards. But you know how couples will come together and everything will be bliss for a certain amount of time, and then it's over. And in human design, the way we define that is that everything has a transit. And as soon as the transit, as soon as the way you hooked up together, changes, shifts in the universe, both people will know that it's perhaps over or coming to another level or shifted into another direction. And we make all these stories that it was him or her and that was wrong and this was wrong and you had to get rid of them because no, it was just a transit and it was done. Nobody was wrong. There wasn't anything wrong with it. The energy was done with that cycle. Mm. Mm -hmm. It was merely an experience. Yes, it was merely an experience. <laughs> well, it's been a great pleasure speaking with you, Emma. It's incredibly, extraordinarily interesting, it's very the interesting. human design system. And I thank you, thank and you. I look forward to inviting you back in the studio again, and we'll talk further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Victoria. you. And from the Art of Conscious Living, please do take care of yourself and take care of others.